He seemed to be standing in the nowhere nothingness of the abyss, but he knew that his physical body still knelt on the floor of the throne hall. With a savage effort of will, he disregarded all sensory impressions, all appearances that prevented him from perceiving where he was. Trembling, jerking awkwardly, he levered his gaunt frame to its feet. The eyes of his body were blind, still caught in Lord Fowl's control, but he grated fiercely, I see you, Fowl. He did not need eyes. He could sense with the nerves of his stiff cheeks the emanations of power around him. He took three lumbering, tottering steps, and felt Fowl suddenly surge toward him, rush to stop him. Before the despiser could reach him, he raised his hands and fell fists first at the ill-earth stone. The instant his wedding band struck the stone, a hurricane of might exploded in his hand. Gales of green and white fire blasted through the air, shattering it like a bayamo. The veil of Lord Fowl's assault was shredded in a moment and blown away. Covenant found himself lying on the floor with a tornado of power gyring upward from his half-hand. He heaved to his feet. With one flex of his arms, he freed his wrists as if the shackles were a skein of lies. Fowl's penumbral shadow crouched in battle readiness across the stone from him. The despiser brandished his carious eyes as if he were frantic to drive them into Covenant's heart. "'Fool!' he howled shrilly. "'Groveller! It is I who rule here. Alone I am your rightful master, and I command the stone. I will destroy you. You will not so much as touch me!' As he yelled, he threw out a flare of force which struck Covenant's hand, embedded itself deep in the core of his ring. Amid its raging gale, the white gold was altered. Cold ill soaked into the metal, forced itself into the ring until all the argent had been violated by green. Again, Covenant felt himself falling out of the throne hall. Without transition, he found himself on Kevin's watch. He stood on the stone platform like a titan, and with his malefic band he alone levied a new ritual of desecration upon the land. All health withered before him. Great gilden trees splintered and broke. Flowers died. Aliantha grew barren and became dust. Soil turned to sand. Rivers ran dry. Stone downs and wood helvens were overthrown. Starvation and homelessness slew every shape of life that walked upon the earth. He was the lord of a ruin more absolute than any other, a desolation utterly irreparable. Never! With one violent thrust of his will, he struck the green from his ring and returned to the throne hall. His wedding band was immaculate silver and the slashing wind of its power was wild beyond all emerald mastery. He almost laughed. The stone could not corrupt him. He was already as fundamentally diseased as any corruption could make him. To the despiser, he rasped, You've had your chance. You've used your filthy power. Now it's my turn. You can't stop me. You've broken too many laws, and I'm outside the law. It doesn't control wild magic. It doesn't control me. But it was the only thing that might have stopped me. You could have used it against me. Now it's just me. It's my will that makes the difference. He was panting heavily. He could not find enough air to support the extremity of his passion. I'm a leper, Fowl. I can stand anything. At once, the despiser attacked him. Fowl put his hands on the ill-earth stone, placed his power on the pulsing heart of its violence. He sent green might raving at Covenant. 
It fell on him like the collapse of a mountain, piled on to him like tons of wrecked stone. At first he could not focus the ring on it, and it drove him staggering backward. But then he found his error. He had tried to use the wild magic like a tool or weapon, something which could be wielded. But High Lord Morham had told him, You are the white gold. It was not a thing to be commanded, employed well or ill as skill or awkwardness allowed. Now that it was awake, it was a part of him, an expression of himself. He did not need to focus it, aim it. Bone and blood, it arose from his passion. With a shout, he threw back the attack, shattered it into a million droplets of rank fever. Again, Lord Fowl struck. Power that fried the air between them sprang at Covenant, strove to interrupt the white, windless gale of the ring. Their conflict coruscated through the throne hall like a mad gibberish of lightning, green and white blasting, battering, devouring each other like all the storms of the world gone insane. Its sheer immensity daunted Covenant, tried like a landslide to sweep the feet of his resolve from under him. He was unacquainted with power, unadept at combat. But his rage for lepers, for the land, for the victims of despite, kept him upright, and his unbelief enabled him. He knew more completely than any native of the land could have known that Lord Fowl was not unbeatable. In this manifestation, despite had no absolute reality of existence. The people of the land would have failed in the face of despite because they were convinced of it. Covenant was not. He was not overwhelmed. He did not believe that he had to fail. Lord Fowl was only an externalized part of himself, not an immortal, not a god. Triumph was possible. So he threw himself heart and soul and blood and bone into the battle. He did not think of defeat. The personal cost was irrelevant. Lord Fowl beat him back until he was pressed to the wall at Foam Follower's side. The savagery of the stone made a holocaust around him, tore every last flicker of warmth from the air, shot great lurid icicles of hatred at him. But he did not falter. The wild magic was passionate and unfathomable, as high as time and as deep as earth. Raw power limited only by the limits of his will. And his will was growing, raising its head, blossoming on the rich sap of rage. Moment by moment, he was becoming equal to the despiser's attack. Soon he was able to move. He forged away from the wall, waded like a strong man through the tempest toward his enemy. White and green blasts scalded the atmosphere. Detonations of savage lightning shattered against each other. Lord Fowl's fiery cold and Covenant's gale tore at each other's throats, rent each other, renewed themselves, and tore again. In the virulence of the battle, Covenant thought that Ridjek Thome would surely come crashing down. But the crash stood. The throne hall stood. Only Covenant and Lord Fowl shook in the thunderous silence of the power storm. Abruptly, he succeeded in driving Lord Fowl back from the stone. At once, his own fire blazed still higher. Without direct contact, the despiser's control over his emerald bane was less perfect. His exertions became more frenzied, erratic. Unmastered force rocked the throne, tore ragged hunks of stone from the ceiling, cracked the floor. He was screaming now in a language Covenant could not understand. The unbeliever grabbed his opportunity. He moved forward, rained furious gouts and bolts of wild magic at the despiser, then suddenly began to form a wall of might between Lord Fowl and the stone. 
Lord Fowl shrieked, tried frantically to regain the stone. But he was too late. In an instant, Covenant's force had surrounded Lord Fowl. With all the rage of his will, he pressed his advantage. He pounced like a hawk, clenched power around the despiser. Whitely, brutally, he began to penetrate the penumbra. Lord Fowl's aura resisted with shrieks and showers of sparks. It was tough, obdurate. It shed Covenant's feral bolts as if they were mere show, incandescent child's play. But he refused to be denied. The dazzling of his wild magic flung shafts and quarrels of might at the emerald glister of the aura until one prodigious blast pierced it. It ruptured with a shock which jarred the throne hall like an earth tremor. Waves of concussion peeled at Covenant's head, hammered at his sore and feverish skull. But he clung to his power, did not let his will wince. The whole penumbra burst into flame like a skin of green tinder, and as it burned, it tore, peeled away, fell in hot shreds and tatters to the floor. Within Covenant's clench, Lord Fowl the Despiser began to appear. By faint degrees, he became material, drifted from corporeal absence to presence. Perfectly molded limbs, as pure as alabaster, grew slowly visible. An old, grand, leonine head, magisterially crowned and bearded with flowing white hair, an enrobed, dignified trunk, broad and solid with strength. Only his eyes showed no change, no stern, impressive surge of incarnation. They lashed constantly at Covenant like fangs wet with venom. When he was fully present, Lord Fowl folded his arms on his chest and said harshly, Now you do in truth see me, Groffler. His tone gave no hint of fear or surrender. Do you yet believe that you are my master? Fool! I grew beyond your petty wisdom or belief long before your world's babyhood. I tell you plainly, Groveler, despite such as mine is the only true fruit of experience and insight, in time you will not do otherwise than I have done. You will learn contempt for your fellow beings, for the small malices which they misname their loves and beliefs and hopes and loyalties. You will learn that it is easier to control them than to forbear, easier and better. You will not do otherwise. You will become a shadow of what I am. You will be a despiser without the courage to despise. Continue, groveler. Destroy my work if you must. Slay me if you can. But make an end. I am weary of your shallow misperception. In spite of himself, Covenant was moved. Lord Fowl's lordly mien, his dignity and resignation, spoke more vividly than any cursing or defiance. Covenant saw that he still had answers to find, regardless of all he had endured. But before he could respond, try to articulate the emotions and intuitions which Lord Fowl's words called up in him, a sudden clap of vehemence splintered the silence of the throne hall. A great invisible door opened in the air at his back. Without warning, strong presences, furious and abhorring, stood behind him. The violence of their emanations almost broke his concentrated hold on Lord Fowl. He clenched his will, steadied himself to face a shock, and turned.